Okay, uh, we are live. Welcome to Boston Basic Income. This week we are talking about the value added tax, um, which is something that's often suggested as something that might be useful to go along with a basic income. So Andrew Yang's uh, basic income plan called the Freedom Dividend has a value added tax associated with it. What a value added tax is, is it's basically just a sales tax uh, that's designed in such a way to make it easier to collect and to align uh, everybody's incentives so that they want to pay it. Uh, so, but essentially we can think of it as, as a sales tax. Um, so some of us read an article from the Wall Street Journal entitled, Should the U.S. Adopt a Value Added Tax? Uh, from 2016. Uh, and it's got uh, it's got art, it's got um, argument by Michael J. Greats in favor of the value added tax, and then an argument by David R. Henderson uh, against the value added tax. Um, so, I guess yeah, we'll do our thing. Oh, I, I just want to say one thing um, before we go around and get everyone's initial thoughts is that. Um, there's something that's always going to be true about a value added tax or a sales tax. It creates a wedge between input prices and output prices. So if you've got, uh, you know, some uh, material or resource that you're using to make the product and then you're selling that to someone else who's going to, you know, put it together into something or something like that. And then finally it gets sold to the consumer at the end, uh, the person who buys it the output price or the consumer price, the price of the final consumer good, is going to move further away from the input price or vice versa. They're going to move apart. That's something that's always going to be true. Uh, so I just wanted to establish that as, as, as the main effect of, of this kind of tax. And it's the same for a value added tax and a sales tax. Uh, so I want to start by going around the room and getting everybody's initial thoughts on uh, value added tax. Is it is it a good idea? Is it useful? Um, what about if it's paired with a basic income? Do the two make each other better? Or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or just initial thoughts if you have questions too. Um, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. I've heard you talk about how it's kind of one of the more uh, neutral taxes that could raise a lot of money in terms of a tax you could levy on a country. In terms of how much sort of neutral in terms of how much it would distort the economy yeah um, so that's interesting to maybe learn more about I know it's also used in a lot of countries which is always sort of an intriguing thing if it's used in a lot of prosperous countries you know that's what yes. thinking about why that's the case uh, and what benefits it may or may not have um, but yeah I'm interested in talking more about it yeah Steve um, well I understand that a sales tax is generally regressive but if all the proceeds from the sales tax go to fund basic income, the basic income is a lot more progressive. So uh, the sales tax regressiveness wouldn't hurt as much. Uh, I am curious about um, the fairly recent uh, syndrome where uh, corporations are hiding their profits, moving their, their profits overseas. And uh, I think Andrew Yang says that uh, value-added tax the sales tax would better keep the profits. Um, well, it would it would make it possible to tax uh, corporate profits um, without them being hidden. And I just like to know if it, that would actually work. Okay, Nick. Um, yeah, I thought one thing that really stood out to me was. About this is more like about the article, not specifically about a value added tax, but that this the, the argument against was really an argument against taxes, or this was really an argument against government spending. Yes, uh, which uh, I found kind of irritating. Yes, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but yeah, those are no real strong. Okay. Any thoughts, Elizabeth? 
Um, I think pretty much like what Bethany and also Nick said though. So like I don't feel like I learned anything useful about the value of the tax so this argument it's like, well the government spends too much we can't trust them to spend, this will help them to have money. I was like, but okay, but could you tell me why specifically this tax is bad? What what about the other guy? I honestly don't remember. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh Richard. Well, <clears throat> I believe it was uh, in the middle of last month, I think it was, that there was a Harvard professor that argued that um, that a value added tax would benefit um, someone who saves more than someone who well, spends fruit Sam or whatever. Oh, yeah, that was the Greg Mankiw. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and, well, that is also mentioned by the first guy in the article, sort of, but to a lesser extent. So yes, that would well, benefit some people over others. Yeah, That's the whole argument of the <laughs> yeah, it. and it's an interesting question. Like, uh, how do we want people to use their money? You know, what incentive do do we want to put in there? Do we want to provide an incentive for people to save, or is you know? Or do you want them to do something else if they're rich people or if they're anyone? Um, so Michael says, probably irrelevant, but I wonder if Andrew Yang actually thinks tying a tax to basic income is necessary or just a political sell. Um, I think it's probably a combination. Uh, I know uh, the first time I met him was a little over a year ago uh, and I was talking about some of my stuff and he asked me if I was a, an MMT guy, like modern monetary theory, and I said no, um, but he at least is aware of some some kind of perspectives where um, taxes don't necessarily fund uh, government spending. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, David Landis says that could be controlled away from the freedom dividend. Is, are you saying that in the sense that it could be controlled separately, like it doesn't have to be um, you know matched up exactly, or we could figure out what the amount of the VAT is based on some other stuff? Anyway, you can you can follow up with that. Um, I want to get to, to Steve's questions. Uh, what were your questions again, Steve? <laughs> um, it actually applies to what David said. That, um, yeah. Freedom dividend aside, you could argue for a VAT just because you want to tax corporate profits before they get hidden overseas. Right. Which is my, also one of my big questions. Yeah, I think that's... So it's... The way it, it prevents corporate profits from being hidden overseas is it's just a tax that's always going to be collected because if you want to sell anything to American consumers, then they're going to have to pay uh, the VAT. And that's not to say there isn't you know, fraud in VAT. It's just a little more complicated. And the VAT is, the VAT is easier to collect than a sales tax because you're, you're, um, it's like double reporting. The person who sold the thing reports and then the person who bought the thing reports all the way down the end, except maybe the last, the re at the retail end, the final consumer does not report. Um, but at that end, uh, you can see this chart over here. The people on the live stream can't see it. Um, but if you're the final retailer and you, uh, and you don't charge the VAT to the consumer, you don't get the, the rebate uh, for the previous person's VAT. So if the amount of VAT that you add is less than 50%, you want to report the VAT because then you'll actually make uh, more money. Oh, that's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wait, what you, can you walk through the less than 50%? I think that's right. Did I say that right? Um, so when I, so, it, so this is the clothing retailer. I buy the shirt from the, the, the clothes maker, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, I understand. Uh, let's say I pay um, $100 for the shirt. Uh, but thirty dollars of that is VAT yeah. that the the clothes maker already paid and included in their price. The clothes maker and the tail and the right the textile mm -hmm. manufacturer and the grower, like it's all those together. All those together. And so every time they sell to the next step, the VAT is included in the price. And then um, when you when you sell to the next person, you get a rebate for the previous producers and for the VAT paid by the previous producers in the line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so if the if the um, farmer and the textile maker and the clothes maker um, all paid thirty dollars of that, that's going to be in the one hundred dollar price that the clothing retailer um, pays 
to the to the clothes maker. Does that make sense? So he's he's already paying thirty dollars of that because it's it's built into the price of the shirt. So I'm the I'm the clothing retailer. I've already paid thirty dollars of that. I want to sell my shirt for a hundred and uh, you know ten dollars. Then I have to pay three dollars of additional VAT, but I get the thirty dollars back because I've only added it's a value added tax. I've only added ten dollars of value, so I only have to pay in net. I only have to pay three, but that'll only be the case if I actually report the whole thing because otherwise I don't get refunded for the for the the VAT paid by the previous guys. Does that make sense? Yeah, Richard. When I came back from. Europe twice. Um, they, on my flight back, they gave me a paper that I had to declare what, that I had uh, what I had purchased or whatever, and they you had the opportunity to reclaim the VAT from the countries you bought things in because they, you only have to pay the VAT for um, if you actually live there or something, and then they, you get a refund for it. Interesting. Yes, so it's definitely more complicated to reason about than a sales tax. But the end result is the same because the end result appears in the, the final price of the product. Or, you know, the, the output price either goes up or the in input price goes down or some combination right. of those. Uh, so the question, you know, a question we could ask is which one will happen? Or to what extent will the output price rise? Will the final price of the, of the good rise? Or to what extent will the prices of the inputs go down? Uh, and inputs can be labor. They can be any, any resources, so that includes labor. Um, and the typical answer to this question is that uh, it depends on how much uh, flexibility the consumers have and how much flexibility the producers have in shifting their price. Uh, so this is called uh, tax incidence, and it depends on you know, how, 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 hard you can, how hard you can push someone in, in price and still being able to sell to them and stuff like that. Um, these are called like the elasticities in the market. Right. You know, how, how, how budgeable everyone is. Can we walk through some examples with that? So like, um, can I try? Yeah, go ahead. So with this shirt example, so that one part of like the flexibility or inflexibility would be like, can consumers afford a shirt over $22 or over $20, like which would be the price without the VAT? Mm -hmm. um, and if they can, I guess you have more flexibility to raise the price. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will, but it means you have the flexibility to do it. Okay. I mean, you're always going to want to charge whatever price is most profitable for your business. Yeah. So, so I guess you have to think about what was setting the $20 price in the first place. Right. So there's a lot of factors that can go into it. I can say that if consumers are desperate for a shirt and they'll do whatever they can to buy the shirt, uh, you know, if you like take it to the extreme, then you have more flexibility in raising the price of the shirt. But then if they were already and, desperate, why isn't the price already at its max? Uh, it could be competition or something like that. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, another, you know, from the producer side, uh, maybe you have the, the farmer, um, he always wants to sell for as much as possible and he's, you know, making a lot of money right now. He'd still be pretty profitable if he lowered his price. So now there's flexibility on his end. So that you might see uh, reflected in lower input prices. Hmm. And why would he do that? Just because like now this is going to otherwise make it more expensive and there's competition for him too or something? Right. Like that. So maybe the other farmers are also in a state, in a position where they're flexible. So other farmers will, will lower their prices because they know that the, the next guy in the, in the, in the chain is, 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 it has some pressure on him to, to lower prices. Like if it was yeah. a trade war and the, there's soybeans that, <laughs> in Brazilian soybeans and um, American soybeans and they can't buy the, the Chinese won't buy as many uh, American soybeans because of the trade war. So you try to lower the price so that, the, say, the Japanese will buy the, hmm. the soybeans instead of the Chinese. Right, right. Interesting. So you're basically just describing competition. Yeah. 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 yeah so yeah. all of these factors. Um, but then. But uh, then. If they're already like this is the lowest price that's profitable for them, and then you add the VAT, they might go out of business or something like that, right? I guess yeah. that's part of the So you're going to see a combination of businesses going out of business uh, if the if the input prices have to be lowered or if they can't lower them any further and they would need to, and um, consumers not being able to buy stuff. They would 
otherwise be able to buy because now the price is higher and they have less money, that kind of thing. So you'll, so you'll see a combination of both of those things. Um, and the question of uh, which effect you see more really depends on what good it is that's being taxed and what the chain of production is and all of that. And it also depends on, um, on what, the, what the consumers are doing in your economy. Uh, so that, that is if you're looking at a that, if like Massachusetts decided to institute a that. I mean, we have a sales tax, which is the same thing. Uh, so that's how you'd, you'd evaluate uh, what would happen in a place like Massachusetts. Um, and there's, these are all empirical questions. So there's like, uh, you know, there's plenty of data and you can look at the data and see how much of the tax burden is borne by consumers versus producers, that kind of thing. Um, it's different when you do it at the level of the whole economy. So we've talked in here about, um, you know, price level, the price level being kept stable um, through monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. Um, if, I'm not going to promise that they're going to do that, but if they did that, output prices would stay the same. So you'd have the same, um, because output prices are consumer prices, and the, the Fed is anchoring things to the consumer price level, which is the average level of consumer prices. So at the level of an individual state or you know a smaller market, you're not at the level of um, you're not at the level of the monetary zone, and the money is the purchasing power of the money is not being calibrated based on prices in Massachusetts. It's being calibrated based on all prices across the entire economy, all consumer prices. So when you're doing it at the level of the whole country, it's possible that you will see no change in output prices, and you'll only see change in input prices, uh, and that means. Consumers, from the from their role as consumer, uh, will not see any effect on on prices. They don't pay any. They don't bear any of the tax burden. Uh, but producers do, and producers obviously that includes workers. And work, some workers are consumers. All workers are consumers. Not all consumers are necessarily workers. Um, but it's hard to um, it's hard to see how the burden would be distributed among different producers. Because that, again, depends on elasticities in the markets and then what firms need to do to lower their prices, how much of that burden is borne by the worker versus the, the investors or owners of the, of the company, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I guess if we're listing like pros and cons in a way, one possible con for the consumer, if it, even if it isn't prices, is that like certain businesses that they would have liked go out of business. Like certain products aren't available or certain businesses aren't there. Is this not uh, profitable anymore? Like less variety of stuff to choose from or something like that. Yeah. Eh, I, I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't well, say that. Well, you called it a disincentive to produce, so what does that look like for consumers? It looks like the productive capacity of the economy goes down. Okay, but what does that look like for, for consumers? If you're just a consumer and your income stays the same, it's... You don't produce as many of the soybeans no, or whatever. No, if you're just a consumer and prices stay the same and the economy was not producing at the full productive capacity and the productive capacity goes down, it looks like nothing to the consumers. Nothing happens. Because it's more about what we could have done that we can't do now. Right. I see. Because if some businesses go out of business, the ones that are still profitable will pick up the slack. Okay. So it's more like we couldn't expand as much as we could have before. Yes. The VAT will decrease the level of basic income that we can afford in the economy than just without a VAT. Because there's less room for consumer spending because there's less productive capacity. Because it's more expensive now to produce what you think. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're basically uh, penalizing people for producing. We're ta it's a tax on all production in the economy. So if you're still producing, you, you need to be still profitable despite the tax. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is obviously kind of the opposite of how Andrew Yang talks about it. He's saying that, that the VAT is funding the freedom dividend. Um, but it's actually making uh, universal basic income less possible than it would be otherwise, is how I would frame it. Now, this is, of course, assuming that uh, the output prices do stay stable. Uh, yeah. yeah, can we talk through the scenario where it seems more, I mean, I would have, if I had to guess, I would have guessed that the, that the uh, Federal Reserve would target stability of the, like the pre-tax price. They definitely target after-tax prices. Okay. But there is an issue, which is that if you just instituted that all at once, that's more of a one-time price shock than it is kind of inflation. So there's, there's two questions we can ask about how the Fed would respond to the VAT. One is uh, how do they respond to the price shock when it's happening, like the shock of introducing the VAT. And then the second question is how does it change their long-run monetary policy after the VAT is already in place? 
And regardless of whether there was a one-time shift in the price level, the long-run policy, you know, interest rate or whatever, should be the same either way. The question is whether they want to correct whether they want to correct for the initial shock or not. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I've heard arguments from both sides. Um, I think a lot of people feel that they wouldn't do that because they tend to target like over time inflation rather than price shocks. Um, and then, you know, some people who argue they would. There's also some debate among like policy experts who say, um, you know, should the Fed really be targeting inflation or they, should they be targeting a specific price level? So if they, if they had price level targeting, that means instead of looking at how prices are changing and, you know, keeping that flat, they look at, you know, they have a, a particular reference price level and, and if it moves, they always bring it back. That's not what they do right now. There are some people who argue that that's what they should be doing. Um, I don't know if that's just what they should be doing. Um, but if there's a, a predictable shock like this, you know, could they absorb it by, uh, you know, raising interest rates temporarily or, or doing something kind of in response directly? Actually, not not entirely sure. Um, before we get on to, uh, you know, the output prices rising, I just want to say that when people talk about the VAT being regressive, that's all based on the assumption that the prices of consumer goods will go up uh, because, the idea is that poor people spend a higher percentage of their income on consumer goods than rich people do. So, so it's regressive with respect to income. If you're still thinking about people's incomes down here, um, yeah, workers' incomes might go down, um, but it's unclear how that, it, how, that, you know, how that relates to other people's incomes going down who are involved in the production process. You know, uh, will the owners of the company's incomes go down even more than the workers' incomes, you know, that kind of thing. So I would say, you know, if this is going up, that's regressive. If this is going down, question mark. I think it's complicated. I, don't, I, I mean, like, maybe some people have the answer to this, but I haven't been able to find it in my admittedly limited uh, research of this. Uh, yeah, so so I don't know. Um, yeah, anyone have any thoughts at that point? At this point, um, so if the I, and I'll, I'll just get quickly into if the output prices uh, do go up, um, that means we're at a higher price level. Um, basically, all of the benefit programs that the government pays out are adjusted for cost of living. So that's gonna automatically bump up people's benefits to match. So you're not going to see, I think some people are worried with the freedom dividend in particular, that if prices go up, then people who receive benefits and for whatever reason their benefits were higher than the $1,000 or something like that, so they choose to keep their existing benefits. If those benefits were, um, yeah, so if they're on those benefits and the prices go up, they're worried that they won't be able to buy as much because they'll have the same benefits, but the prices will be higher. But all of those benefits are cost of living adjusted. So, so you know, even if prices do go up, you're not going to have that problem. Yeah, uh, Richard. What if it's like deflation or like the television, there, there's suddenly a massive increase in uh, efficiency or something and the price goes down? Uh, so that's unrelated to the VAT, right? sort of related to the bad, if something like that happened, what would happen with the bad exact? What would it generate as much income? Would it down? I well, don't know I would think. Well, you, phrase it. generally speaking, um, you know, when the Fed uh, targets inflation, they, you know, these things are gradual, like improvements in efficiency and stuff like that. So they will respond to, um, you know, technological advancement uh, using monetary stimulus to keep the prices up. So you're not gonna see all prices go down across the entire economy. You're not gonna see deflation because the Fed's gonna prevent it. Um, now, if there, so in terms of the VAT, um, yeah, I mean, the, the VAT is just a per percentage on all sales. Uh, so whatever the price level is, the, the real, uh, I guess uh, revenue generated by the VAT is going to be um, is going to be proportional to the total amount of, of goods sold. The total the total. Yeah, but the around. second guy in the article, I guess he was sort of arguing that the the government would want to keep revenues 
a certain level. And so if prices were def deflated or whatever, then they would want to increase the VAT. Is that like sort of what the guy was arguing? So he's asking if you could, if you could increase the VAT to keep prices up and prevent deflation. Um, like doing that instead of, instead of uh, monetary policy, instead of, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you kind of, you, you could do that. It would, it still, would still have this effect of separating the input prices from the output prices. And that's a little bit, a little bit weird. So you could imagine uh, the output prices staying the same over time and then to compensate for uh, potential deflationary pressures instead of, um, you know, using uh, lower interest rates, you just increase the VAT and then the, the input prices just keep going down and down and down and down. I would imagine that would be pretty weird for the economy. It'd be, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to make sense of what the second guy was saying in the article. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to the article in a second or in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you would want to explicitly use a VAT to uh, control the price level in the economy. I don't think that that makes much sense. He's just trying to, he was talking about increasing government revenue. So if the prices of the, all the goods go down, then you want, and the government wants to generate the same amount of revenues, then they maybe you want to increase the VAT or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds like what you're suggesting, that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that instead of using monetary policy to keep prices up, we use the VAT. No, to keep government revenues. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that, uh, that keep... argument applies to other kinds of taxes, like income taxes, too. Right? I mean, we don't have the, the, the Congress doesn't change the income tax rate every time there's a recession when it comes to that. Actually, they were like, we find be... payroll taxes and things. Right, they do the opposite. To simulate yeah, I mean, they tend to do counter cyclical things. So you're saying if prices happen to go down, you might want to. They might want to increase the VAT to keep uh, the government's nominal revenues the same. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Prices or just like how much people are buying. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I yeah. I I think um, I think what he's mostly worried about is just the government uh, continuing to raise the VAT to 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 boost revenue, and he doesn't want the government to have revenue. Is basically his issue. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to add uh, one thing about the when we transition into the VAT. If you rolled out the VAT gradually over a period of time, then I feel like um, I feel like the existing Fed's policy of um, inflation targeting would actually keep prices stable. Um, you know, it'd be pretty clear, like, it's, since it's the, gra the effect of the, the VAT is, is gradual, that it's not like a one-time price shock, that the Fed would compensate for it over time. So I guess the real question is, if it is implemented all at once, uh, which I'm imagining that's what Andrew Yang wants to do, um, then how does the Fed respond? It's an interesting question. Um, and we talked about people's, uh, we talked about people's um, benefit government benefit programs being indexed to inflation or adjusted for cost of living. You know what's not adjusted for cost of living? People's wages. So if there are poor people who are only surviving on benefit programs, then they see no, they don't lose anything uh, under, the, under the VAT sudden price increase. But if there are poor people who are getting wages um, and they are receiving benefits, then the wage part of their income, their the real wage would decrease because the nominal wage stays the same. Right. At least or initially. people who are like, you know, it would make a difference in their life, even though they might not be receiving benefits. Like their income isn't that high or something like that. What? Well, if you're talking about people. Well, there's just a lot of people, maybe half the population, who would notice a difference in price increase, oh, any, even any, if they're not receiving. Anyone benefits. who's anyone who's getting their income from wages, right. like if people are getting 100 percent of their income from wages, that's then, what I mean. Yeah. Then they then they yeah. would would lose with a price increase. Right. Yeah. Um, but if it comes at the same time as freedom dividend, well, then that's yeah. Or basic income, then it's a lot more like that would help right. the adjustment. Yes, if you have a basic income, then the whole combination of that and basic income becomes very progressive because the you can imagine like the most regressive tax ever would be like 
well, not like you could imagine even more aggressive, but like of the of the realistic taxes that people actually consider, the the on the most regressive one is like a poll tax, where uh, you just have to pay X amount of money every month if you're a person. That's like the most extreme regressive tax. Uh, basic income is a negative poll tax, so it's extreme progressive. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the extreme progressive will more than cancel out the slightly regressive uh, VAT. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we got, yeah, Richard, go ahead. Oh, I was playing uh, Yeah, so we got some comments on here. Um, I do not know how, uh, Mitchell says, I do not know how something like art with large fluctuations in price would be assessed before a retail or end consumer sale is made. What would the value uh, would be taxed uh, to the middle person's sale? Um, I, and I think it all has to do with the prices. Whatever, whatever price uh, you sell it at, that's going to be, the VAT is going to be applied to that. And then whatever different difference in price there is between uh, the people in the middle, that's what the VAT would be applied to. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, a question we can ask is um, selling things on secondary markets because um, you're not really adding value there necessarily. So if someone's selling a piece of art or even just something else like a car or something like that, um, you know, it's not really part of the production process. It's a, it's a secondary thing. So I don't think the VAT usually applies to those things, just like a sales tax. Well, what a sale does a sales tax apply to like sale, selling secondary and secondary markets? Like you pay a sales tax on a new car, do you pay a sales tax on a used car if you buy the well, a new car in the market or whatever. Right. But if you do if you buy it in the informal market then it doesn't apply. Interesting. But that's cuz no one does taxes in the informal market. Is the, is that right or is there a law that says you don't have to if it's in the informal market? I mean, I assume it's just because no, like, I mean, yeah. if, you, if you like sell your car to like your cousin for a dollar, <laughs> well, like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess that's like a legal, like, legal pay binding 10 cent thing. Tax. And so I guess yeah. like they don't enforce taxes in the secondary market yeah. in that way because there's no government thing being like, oh, this is like, well, you know, some cars there is though, right? Like you have to to register the car. Usually, I mean, I've only got yeah. transfers of title in California. But you have to you have to send in like how much you paid for it, who you paid yeah. it to, what the mileage yeah. was. And, yeah, but I don't remember whether I mean, and you have to send a bunch of money to the government. Yeah, but whether it's yeah, sales tax or title. just um, yeah, I feel like it's not sales. I mean, I've never actually yeah, like so. bothered so. yeah. like. Um, yeah. So this is all this is all kind of details, and it can be interesting to get into. Um, it's related but, to one of the things I was wondering yeah. about, which is. I'm curious for a little more detail. I don't know if any any of um, you guys know. In in Yang's proposal, you know, he's saying we're gonna get a bunch of money out of Google that we're not getting now. Yes. Is that because when they sell an ad to somebody, they're gonna be charging that for it? Uh, and they now. also get a piece of the money when. They, they direct someone to a product and someone buys that product because of the advertisement or whatever. That's uh, like a way of paying so, for the ad, right? Yeah, so I think, I think yes, I think that's right. Um, and I think, you know, it's, the VAT is not targeting, even Andrew Yang's version of the VAT is not targeting any specific company. He just has this assumption that automation and technology is going to become more and more of the production process. So if you tax the production process, then more and more of that is going to be paid by um, by the technology. I have heard him say, yeah. you know, like, what's the oil of the 21st century? It's right. data, and, like, right. Google's right. making all this money. Yeah. It, but what is the, what is the, I, I'm just trying to figure out what is the big change that allows the government to get a little bunch of revenue from Google? Is it that uh, now that corporate taxes are just sort of 
at the end of the year, you net yeah, out and they hide a lot of them and they figure out a way to jack up their yeah. expenses. Right. So it's not just netting out. So they they do net out. They do try to benefit from various subsidies that are in place. You know, when people talk about loopholes, it's usually there's like exceptions in the tax code, and they usually put those uh, exceptions in there to incentivize certain behaviors and that kind of thing. And you know. Uh, so that's part of it. And then the other part is kind of what Bethany just brought up and what Steve brought up earlier, which is that if you're not an American company, um, you know, like if you're if you're set up in Ireland or something like that, then the same tax laws might not apply to you or it might be harder for the United States government to see what you're doing and what's appropriate to be taxed and that kind of thing. There are ways of kind of structuring things internationally, offshore, you know, tax havens, that kind of thing. Um, so I think, uh, you but know, would a VAT change that? I mean, like, yes, because a VAT, if you're selling to American consumers, it's paid at the point of sale. But Google, like consumers aren't sending money to Google. Well, if American advertisers. Right. Yeah. It's just going to be like, oh, you know, now it's Nike Ireland paying, <laughs> Nike, you know, paying Google Ireland for global ads. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I'm so, not so confident that I'm, these well-financed <laughs> legal teams won't find a way around I, there it. Are, there are tricks that people play with the VAT. That is true. Um, so the, the rationale for it is that, it's, is that it's easier to collect than the current you know, way we do things. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. Right. Yeah. And I guess it's easier to see with like Amazon is another example he gives. Because like a lot of Americans buy products right off of Amazon and those Americans are going to stay Americans. So then it seems like it's harder to find a loophole where you wouldn't pay 10% or whatever. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that. I agree that with like ads and data, it's a little bit like more confusing how they would pay. But. Yeah. So I think the, the VAT on its own, if you just, um, you know, don't have a basic income and you just have a VAT and throw away the money that you collect, uh, it's probably not good for the economy, not good for people, uh, even if you keep consumer prices stable because, uh, you know, producers lose out, people might... Well, wouldn't any tax that you just throw away be net negative? You're just taking money away from people for no reason? No, not at all. Uh, oh, like a disincentive to do something? Yeah, if there's, yeah, if there's, if there's a, a resource that's being wasted or something like that and you want to tax that, that, then that can be helpful to people, helpful to the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll um, take it back. Carbon tax yeah. is another example, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I, like I say in here, you know, the basic income doesn't need to be paired with a VAT and in fact, or it doesn't need to be paired with any tax at all. And in fact, the VAT will uh, lower the uh, amount of basic income we can afford. It probably won't lower it be below a thousand dollars a month. Um, so I would imagine that the effect of the combination of the, uh, of at least Andrew Yang's thousand dollars a month basic income, uh, plus the VAT would be that it's, it's entirely an expansion of, of the social safety net. Uh, there's no one who gets less, at least on the consumer side, there's no one who gets less than what they were getting before. There might be some workers who uh, lose their jobs or get paid less. Yeah. Um, you guys ready for the article? Yeah. Yeah. Not that one. Uh, so this is kind of just rehashing. A VAT taxes what people consume rather than how much they earn. But this is also a reason why some consider a VAT to be unfair, because the critics say the burden of taxation falls disproportionately on those with lower incomes. Uh, and that's only true if the output price increases, if consumer prices increase. Yes. I guess another thought I have on this, which is maybe not well formed, yeah. is, I mean, I guess there's the fact that people with higher incomes save money, but people with higher incomes also spend like large amounts of money on the same kind of item. Like, let's say that they would buy like a $100,000 bottle of champagne instead of a $10 bottle of champagne. So then they're paying like a lot more VAT for the same kind of like item. I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't that's, know if this makes any sense. So, so, so that's right. The rich pay... Uh, more but the under same the VAT. stuff, kind of. Well, well, <laughs> un, un, under a VAT, rich people, rich consumers will pay more than poor consumers, right. but they're still going to be paying less 
as a proportion of their total income. That's what makes it regressive. It's as you know regressive with respect to the proportion of your income. Proportion of the income. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, and I and, and I don't think that story changes with a, a ten thousand dollar bottle of champagne. It's still they're still consuming ten thousand dollars worth of stuff. In terms of resource usage, it's much more efficient. It's not you know it's not a problem for um, it's not a problem for the rest of the economy if someone spends a lot of money on a bottle of champagne because it's still only uses the resources of one bottle of champagne, and that's that's fine. If, we, if rich people are wasting their money on things, you know, that's the kind of thing we want them wasting their money on because it doesn't hurt anyone. Yeah. yeah. Not private jets. Not private jets. That is a uh, very... Diamonds, not jets. Diamonds, not jets. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> diamonds and... I, fake Tentas. diamonds, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like fake La diamonds. Lab grown diamonds. Not fake, but lab. Lab, lab, lab grown diamonds. diamonds. Yeah. Yeah. Lab diamonds, yeah. yes. Uh, right. Or there champagne. are certain diamonds that are not appropriate. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway. So I think that's right. So I think, you know, I think that's an important insight. But in terms of how people think about regressivity, yeah. it's all about money. I guess I was, yeah. yeah, I was adding in my mind that the taxes were then going to be used, I guess, for something that probably disproportionately helps poor people also. Like even in a, in a different framework where there wasn't a basic income, like they might be used on public spending. Like even if they're used on a park that benefits everybody, yeah, it's arguably not that regressive anymore because maybe a lot of people benefit from the park, and a lot of the dollars are still being put in by the wealthy people, something like that. Yes, uh, and then there are arguments about if the government needs to collect X amount of money, how should they What's do the it? What's the best way to do it? Yeah, right, right. and yeah, when thing. people are thinking in that you know mindset, then the answer to that question is usually well. Um, if you care about poor people, you want it to be the tax to be as progressive as possible. You want, you know, like a prog progressive income tax or something like that. Um, well, then you have to think about secondary effects on the economy, which could come back around to poor people. Too. People hardly ever think about secondary effects on the economy. But they really should. Discuss, but they really should. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be nice if people only thought about what you call secondary effects, which is, you know, how does it affect the economy? And they ignored any revenue, you know, that was generated by the tax. Because that's not what actually allows the government to spend money. But I mean, even if you're yeah. like a state or a city, you should consider both, right? Yeah. So if you're this is, that's a good question. If you're a city and you have to um, and you have to raise taxes, you should consider both. I'm not saying it yes. would lead to a different answer, but you should at least think about whether there's going to what the consequences on the economy yeah. that could affect also the poorer people or, or whoever. And, and actually, yeah. yeah, I do think this is a good question to be asking, um, and we can ask, you know, if we are instituting a basic income at the national level. Um, and we are constrained politically so that we have to make it revenue neutral. What is the best tax right. that we can pair it with? And that's interesting. Yeah, you have to take in the uh, primary effect of like who's who's getting taxed more, that kind of thing. But you also have to take into account how it affects people's incentives and the behavior of the economy. Are we going to mm -hmm. produce less? Does it end up making? poor people worse off if you tax rich people more, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Those kind of things are hard to figure out. Um, but there's a lot of people who work on them and there's some, mm -hmm. you know, there's some great empirical work that shows various things. Um, yeah. I would say that I can think of a, of a few taxes that would be better than a VAT. Um, I'm not 100% sold on income tax. Uh, even though it's more progressive, I'm a little bit more afraid of how it affects market incentives. Um, but there are certain incentives that we want in the market that we can use taxes to uh, provide. So I think a big one is a land value tax. Uh, so what that is, is you're used to property taxes where you pay a tax on whatever your property is worth, your home or whatever. The land value tax is a tax on just the plot of land. Uh, as if there was no house there, uh, or it doesn't matter what's what's being built there. So this is something that you have to pay no matter what if you own the land. So that provides an incentive to actually use the land prof profitably, uh, because if you improve, if you make improvements, you don't have to pay tax taxes on those improvements, uh, but you can make money by building some really cool apartments and renting them out, or you know. Uh, Building great businesses there that 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 then rent from you or you know like that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you or you know like it's not worth it to you to have um, you know uh, an empty plot of land just sitting there and paying money. Maybe you want a really cool house, but you'll actually build the house on the plot of land 
if you're being taxed the same so either way. So why would people hold on to bought the land now and not try to make money off of them? Just because it's speculation. Oh, right. So speculation. they want someone to find that piece of property mm. yes. profitable I see. so they can build houses or right. whatever. So this right. would kind of disincentivize the waste of land. That's exactly right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I think... It disincentivize like massive estates too. So like, let's have 6,000 mm -hmm. acres for this estate and when you can only have... Or we can have like a five acres instead of the same sort of house. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, property tax does apply to undeveloped land also, right? So, so you are, yes. it's already expensive to build your house on a 6,000 acre lot. Yes. So the idea with a land value tax is usually that the tax on the unimproved land would be a higher a higher percentage of the total value of that land, and then you wouldn't pay any tax at all on whatever you develop on the land, just to get the incentives, right? So yeah. that you're actually developing. Exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, and it's also the case that, you know, the way they calculate the unimproved value of the land is they look at all the adjacent properties, how much those are worth. So as your neighbors develop, that makes you have to pay a higher tax. Uh, but you don't see, you don't get a penalty from d developing yourself. So in the end, you still right. get higher taxes from everyone because um, they're collectively developing more and more. Uh, but you know, it's it's not something that it's that's not a, a direct... strange like disincentive to to like right, right now. There's actually a disincentive to improve your house or like yeah. your whatever because you have to pay more property tax on your house if you make it better. Whereas yeah. you're if the people around you make it better, you still get, have to pay more. So it's still tracking right. that, but it's not directly disincentivizing you. From improving your house which is right. pretty clever actually an empty plot of land in the middle of the city is worth way more than an empty plot of land in the middle of the, the country yeah i don't want to say the sahara because i, I want to have comparable you know like environments of you know right. temperate whatever <laughs> but i've heard that you can have a, a a skyscraper in the middle of new york and it's worth a lot but in sahara it's just worth the steel and the concrete or whatever <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I wanted to emphasize the role of, you know, uh, adjacent development versus yeah. not. Um, so this is a cool yeah. idea. Yeah. But I mean, there are other things, I guess. So land value tax, carbon tax, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, any other? Any Financial other? transaction tax. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about There's that one. There's also the wealth tax, too. And so I think, I think both a financial transactions tax and a wealth tax are terrible ideas. Um, so the problem with the financial transactions tax is that if I pay, you know, I'm not going to draw this on the board, but if I pay Bethany $40, um, you know, I send it to her over the internet or something like that, there are maybe like dozens of different transactions that happen, you know, back and forth in that process to send her $40. So if you have even a tiny, tiny, tiny financial transactions tax, then we're not going to be able to make normal payments anymore. It just breaks breaks the economy. Well, I thought that just really it was financial transactions were just for like uh, stocks or something. Maybe transaction isn't the word. Maybe uh, financial transactions that are actually buying and selling something like a like a, uh, a normal sales tax would be applied to only the sales tax applied to financial like buying and selling. Something. Yeah, I mean, if you limit it specifically to like the buying and selling of like stocks and bonds or something like that, then sure. What, I mean, uh, I, I don't know that it would, I don't know that that's the kind of thing that would, you know, when I talk about the land value tax and the carbon tax, like there's specific incentives that we want to produce there, that we want to generate. I don't know that there's an equivalent there with the financial transactions tax, except maybe just like an excuse to generate more revenue. You know what or I mean? maybe... Well, I would uh, I would defend it as it it really is buying and selling, so it should be subject to sales tax, even even though it's not uh, tangible stuff. Also, I mean, I th I think that's fine, I, but what I'm saying here is that these things have an advantage over something like VAT or a sales tax. So it might be equivalent to a VAT or a sales tax, but um, I don't think I don't think that kind of tax has the kind of positive incentives in the market that that you know we want. Alex uh, is kind of listing okay. taxes that he likes better than better than yes. better than yeah. the sales tax. Well, uh, Ellen Brown likes the uh, financial transaction tax because, if I'm if I'm understanding it, uh, particularly because of high frequency trading, 
She says that there's five quadrillion dollars a year in uh, financial buying and selling. Um, and if you consider, uh, you know, high frequency trading as, you know, money at that velocity, um, then I guess I could understand it could be five quadrillion. But it's also uh, literally buying and selling of stuff in a few milliseconds and then sell, you know, buying it right. and a few milliseconds later selling it back. So it is buying and selling. So she wants to end that. Basically. Well, on the one hand, high frequency trading is uh, a lot of people think is bad and should right. be ended or, or mitigated. Right. Um, and it's literally buying and selling. So putting even the tiniest of sales tax on the buying and selling is uh, in a metal, uh, defensible in principle and might make it uh, uh, make the brokers do less of it and it'd be less likely to destroy right. the economy in a millisecond and so on. I think that's reasonable. It won't generate any revenue because you've, you've killed that whole way of making money. You know, you can't have high frequency trading well, anymore. Yeah, Ellen, yeah. Ellen Brown um, would be fine with that too. Okay, all right, so that's what she wants. Maybe that's a reasonable thing to, to do. Um, I don't know that I don't know that there is a functional useful purpose to the economy for that level of high frequency trading. I'm not sure that there isn't, but I don't know that there is either. Um, so you're saying you don't know if it'd be harmful to get rid of it or not, basically. Yeah, my intuition is that it would be fine to get rid of it. Hmm. Yeah, um, but I can't say that with 100% confidence. Um, I know there are some people who talk about um, kind of the stuff I was talking about before. Anytime you make a transaction, like there's all kinds of right. uh, all kinds of stuff, and they talk about taxing that and and how much you know how much the volume of yeah. these things. But it's really just like um, you know bookkeeping that's needed uh, to make make the payment system happen, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question. So, yeah. so do you think that all of the taxes that we would want to target, like we would want to levy just for the incentive value, yeah. would add up to enough to fund a basic income? Because no. we, we were like doing this thought experiment of like, what if you had to fund it in a revenue neutral way? Right. So the question is, is what level of basic income do you want? Could you maybe, if you're if you if you're choosing the amount of the basic income ahead of time, like if you choose a thousand dollars a month, could you maybe get to a thousand dollars a month using these kinds of taxes? Maybe. Maybe. I'm maybe. a little skeptical, but maybe. Well, I don't know. Well, we could we could try it and find out, right? Right. Um, if you are trying to calibrate the level of basic income to the maximum level the economy can sustain, then no, there's no way, right? Um, there's no way that the the exact optimal level of taxation happens to generate the exact amount of revenue that corresponds with the exact level of basic income you want to pay out. It just, right. There's no way. But right. I guess what I'm also wondering is yeah. like, if you wanted, for whatever reason, to have a larger basic income than was funded by these incentive taxes, like what tax would, and you had to have a tax funded, like what tax would you turn to? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that that is bad. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's as bad as something like uh, an income tax or... Um, I guess, what are some other taxes? Wealth tax. Um, oh, yeah, wealth tax is really bad. Yeah, so I wanted to quickly say uh, something on wealth tax. Um, it's, it's really hard to define how much wealth someone has. And I've heard that, like, you could try to, how much is this, these um, songs going to be worth, or are they worth? in like 10 years or something and things like that? Yeah. Um, I think there's ways to provide an incentive for people to want to report having a high amount of wealth. I think there people have various kind of clever tricks to do that. Like if you announce that something is worth a certain amount, um, then you have to be willing to sell it if the government comes in and says, I want to buy that from you or something like that. Um, so there's, there's certain things like that. Um, it gets it gets really messy. Um, so in terms of the in terms of the revenue generated, um, it might not be that much. And then it also you know people are going to want to not be wealthy in America. So even if you're not technically avoiding the wealth tax, this is kind of the point that Greg Mankiw brought up, which is that if you have a very high income. Um, 
you're going to want to spend it all as quickly as possible to get out of the wealth tax by not being wealthy, right? Uh, so that's a little bit of a weird thing. We don't necessarily want rich people, you know, dumping their money on the economy, and we don't want them necessarily leaving the country either. Um, it just there there isn't really a scenario in my mind where a wealth tax would make sense or where I feel like it would help people. But they can also yeah. like buy a really expensive diamond and then move it over to Japan or something where they don't have a wealth tax and then sell it there. Yeah, I mean, there's various ways of getting around things. If it's just a specific thing like that, then, then you know, presumably there would be a way to find a record of that specific diamond and they know that they're trans or something. I don't know. Um, but it's, wealth is a, is a really hard thing to define. Um, and I even talk about, like, uh, you know, I avoid talking about how much money is in the economy because I don't think that's something that's reasonable to define either. Uh, you know, when people are talking about inflation, oh, more money in the economy means inflation. Like, you can't even define how much money is in the economy. What matters is the level of spending. And I think it's the same thing with this. Like, like incomes are far more um, something we can wrap our heads around or, or, or um, measure or understand or use than, than something like wealth. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So it seems like you would prefer the VAT to like an income tax, for example. I would prefer the VAT and, to an income tax. I would prefer the income tax to a wealth tax. And I'm, I'm trying to think about like, so a VAT is a disincentive on all production and an income yes. tax is a disincentive on earning money. Do you, is that like, do you think that the second one is worse than the first as a disincentive? And, and if so, why? Or, or is there another reason that you prefer VAT over income tax? Um, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the the income tax punishes people more for um, maybe being more productive or producing more, that kind of thing. And they can uh, um, not um, record or whatever the their the amount of income they have, so they can qualify for benefits or something. Right. Um, yeah, an income tax makes things more complicated. You have to track how much income people have and all of that. Um, I mean, it's hard for me because I don't care about any revenue generated. And a lot of kind of like the ethical arguments or moral arguments about the different taxes um, have to do with how much money you're taking from who, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So you're wondering, you're wondering if that really is better than an income tax. What are your thoughts? Well, I guess I just want to think, I want to understand your logic for like the ways that both of them affect incentives. And in a way, you could, it seems like a disincentive on all production is bad, but I guess it's kind of a mild one that's sort of easy to absorb. I think it's, I, I think what I like about it is that it's simpler. We can reason about it better. We can understand how the economy works better if there's just a blanket VAT. Hmm. Um, what about a flat tax like they have in Estonia? A VAT is largely equivalent to a flat tax. Um, but what kind of flat tax? Is it? Like a flat tax on income, flat income tax. Is and that mean? Businesses and everything, it's like 20% on everything. Uh, what do you mean everything? Like there's a, on like businesses and income and the, like um, the corporate taxes, I think. So it's all uh, personal income, corporate income, that kind of thing. And um, like flat tax as well of twenty percent. On what? On like uh, shirts or whatever. Okay, so it's a sales tax and an income tax, basically. Mm -hmm. That's my um, Estonia has a simple broad-based value-added tax with a 20% tax rate. It also has a relatively flat 21% income tax rate. Oh, interesting. Okay. According to the tax foundation in 2014. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's that's uh, a non-progressive income tax and a VAT. Um, and that's an interesting question. Do I prefer a non-progressive income tax to an income tax? I think I'm saying yes. That's interesting. Yeah. Why? Uh, because it's uh, simpler and and even though the tax as a whole distorts the market it kind of does it in an even way and I feel like that would be more efficient. Does it really do it in an even way? Because I feel like there's a mar decreasing marginal utility of the dollar to, p to a person so to consider like the amounts the same at any income level seems incorrect in terms of their degree of incentives. It's, it's like with Spendthrift Sam and S Saving Frank or whatever it is. 
Frugal Frank. Frugal Frank. I think. You got to have the alliteration. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a good point about. Um, it's a good point about diminishing marginal utility of money. I mean, I think in order to really kind of evaluate this stuff, you have to start thinking about stuff like that, and then it, and then it can get really complicated. Um, and the even if you have diminishing marginal utility of money, it still might produce the same incentives to not earn as much or, I don't know, various things like that. It just feels like it, it makes everything more complicated and more complicated is not good. Yeah. But I guess I'm, I don't know. What? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I just, it's hard. To, it's just hard for me to compare disincentive for me to make more money or be productive as an individual versus disincentive for the whole economy to be productive. Um, well, I think part of it is that we don't really need... So, so consumption is individual and production is collective. Uh, so what I mean by that is that we want everyone to be able to benefit from goods and services in the economy. Uh, we want a certain amount of stuff to be produced for people. We want as much stuff to be produced for people as possible. Uh, we want everyone to be consuming it. It doesn't really matter who makes it. What matters is that the incentives in the economy are such that the right amount of labor is being performed and the right amount of resources are being contributed. It doesn't like I'm not as worried about disincentivizing, uh, you know, maybe a worker at a normal job as I am about um, disincentivizing uh, someone who's involved with producing a lot more of the stuff or something like so that. Then wouldn't you be more for income tax than than value added tax? Why? Because value added tax disincentivizes the entire production of the economy. Well, a progressive income tax disproportionately disincentivizes the uh, the higher income. So, like the people producing more stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of the point I'm making, I guess. Right. It doesn't really matter if if most people aren't working, right? What matters is is. But it matters what the whole economy is producing. Like that's part of what you just talked about. Right. So. It matters what the whole economy is producing, and it matters what individual people are able to access. Um, and of course, this, you know, everything I'm saying gets more complicated when people's incomes are coming from wages too. Um, maybe I change my mind if. You know, like if it would cause people's wage income to go down or something like that. The economy gets really complicated, you guys, when you don't have a basic income. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about a capital gains tax, where they buy a stock for 10 and then you sell it for 100 and they tax some percentage of that? That's a tricky one. Uh, capital gains are lower than, than, capital gains tax is lower than normal income tax, um, partly because we want to provide an incentive for uh people to invest in companies for for rich people to uh kind of use their money that way um that's better than flying around in a private jet uh for example um if you're just thinking about um who bears the burden of the tax and the fact that rich people are uh getting a break then it feels like it might be ethically or morally wrong or something like that uh to have capital gains taxes be so low and because the Instead of a the CEO getting a salary, they get uh, so many uh, shares of stock and then they can sell those shares instead. Like, yeah. I mean, I think, I think in general, that's the kind of thing we want people to be doing. We want people to be investing in companies. We want pe rich people to be using their money in that way rather than uh, necessarily through consumption. So I don't know that we would be better off if we increased the capital gains tax to match the income tax. Because then you might just incentivize more like resource waste instead of investment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, taxes feel different depending on whether you're looking at it from a perspective of who's paying it and is it fair that right. rich people are paying less or that kind of thing versus what outcomes do we ultimately want for people. Um, and it gets really complicated when um, people's incomes are depending on jobs too, because a lot of times, you know, a, a lot of the reason we want, um, you know, business investment is because that creates jobs too, and right. maybe we won't want that as much uh, if we have a basic income. Uh, so maybe we'd be more okay with uh, with a capital gains tax being higher or something like that. Really complicated stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Um, 
in an ideal world, we wouldn't have any taxes except for taxes that uh, change people's incentives in ways we want, and we pay out the maximum basic income that the economy can sustain. So, a um, couple comments on here. Um, Yang says that would be like a sliver for every purchase, but he does not say for what products it would be. So I think it's generally a blanket that on all products. Um, he has mentioned that there might be some uh, exemptions like food for, and things. yeah, for like food and other consumer staples. Um, Michael says when he buys a car, he did, from someone else, he does have to pay a sales tax. Oh, That's interesting. interesting. Um, do. And Michael asks, what purpose other than disincentivizing activity with negative effects like CO2 emission do taxes have? And I would say, ultimately, that is the only purpose of taxes. Um, so you want to, so other negative effects could be resource waste, waste. so you don't want to like chop down too many trees or... Syntax, like an alcohol or cigarettes. Yeah. Generally, you tax the things that you want people to do less of. Uh, and I think that's really the only, at the, at the level of the monetary authority, at the level of the, of the government, that's the only kind of tax that you would really want. Um, there are other taxes in our economy that we don't call taxes. Um, so, for example, you, if you pay rent, um, that's a form of tax. It's a tax you're paying to your landlord. Um, those, those things make sense because... You know, that's kind of the market figuring out prices for things. Um, and then there's the question of taxes at the level of individual cities. Um, I think you kind of, you kind of need those. Um, I've talked before about how it would be nice if not only did everyone have a basic income, but the states were funded by the federal government and then the cities were funded by the states based on, you know, population or something like that. Uh, so that instead of cities having their own taxes or something like that, you would you would get funding from the level of government above you. Um, so I think that that would that would maybe be pretty cool. There's all but yeah. there's an incent, uh, incentive for some people, some places to not report the number of illegal immigrants so that they don't get as much funding or some black or thing like that. You would a city would want less funding. That's, that's what so uh, so they don't um, have as much representation or right. something. Right. I think there's an incentive to un underreport illegal immigrants so that they get less representation. I think if you were paying people money to report people, that would be an incentive to report the illegal immigrants because then your city gets more money. Uh, so maybe that would actually help uh, help with that effect a little bit. Um, Assuming they, they count illegal immigrants in the money that they use to fund the cities. So that's, that's a whole other issue. Um, so I think there's, there's a role for taxes at local funding. Um, I kind of wish there didn't have to be. Um, I kind of wish that all taxes kind of took, were only uh, market things, like actual like rent that people were charging or something like that. Or the incentive stuff. Right, right, right. The incentive stuff too. In Germany, Not for they raising fund their, edu yeah. their um, public education system through, through for the federal government, and so all the the schools receive like ninety within within a ten percent band, uh, ninety percent of their um, at least ninety percent of the same amount of school per uh, you know ta um, money per student or something. Cool. All right. So it would be something like that for all the states and cities and things? Um, yeah, that's what I'm imagining. So you can imagine like schools are funded by the government, the states are funded by the government, the cities are funded by the state that they're in, that kind of thing. And then individual people get the basic income as well. Yeah. And of course that um, that's all, you know, like what, what amounts um, we give to the states and the cities versus the basic income comes back to this question of w how many and which resources are best allocated by governments and which resources are best allocated by individuals. And you can extend that question to reach which resources are allocated best by individuals in the market, or not just individuals, but by the market. Which resources are most efficiently allocated by the market? That's the basic income. Which resources are most efficiently allocated at the level of the city or the community? And which resources are best allocated at the state or at the level of the federal government? Um, 
so then you you know like I don't know if this is an easy thing to figure out. It's not, um, but you know that's kind of the framework that you would want to have in mind with this kind of system. Yeah. Um, so let's get to another quote. Unlike a traditional sales tax, a VAT is a levy on consumption that taxes the value added to a product or service by businesses at each point in the chain of production. Businesses along the chain collect the tax and send it to the government, which supporters say is a boon for efficiency of revenue collection efforts. But ultimately, it is the consumer who pays the tax because the final price of the goods and services they buy reflects all of the taxes that have been charged up to that point. The taxes are all baked into the retail price. So this is an interesting thing that is common with VAT, um, which is that the prices are tax inclusive. So you look at the price of the thing on the shelf and that's the price you pay. The tax is part of that. You can do that with a sales tax too. We just tend not to do that. Uh, individual retailers are allowed to do it, but they don't want to because then all their price tags show higher prices, right? right? Um, so I think I, I actually like the um, tax inclusive prices. It makes it much simpler for consumers. Um, I think it would be nice if we had a law here that in Massachusetts that said, you know, sales tax had to be included in the price. That would be fantastic. Um, but we don't have that. Um, but the point they're making here is that uh, because people don't see the tax, um, they are uh, less upset about paying it. Uh, so that makes it easier to levy in terms of people's psychology, right? Seems very I feel like you do see it though. Like I was in Canada this summer, and I think it. Yeah. You know, the VAT is printed on the receipt usually. Yeah. Uh, so it's like you when you look on the shelf, it's maybe it's the, the price is inclusive. Right. But you get a breakdown. Right. Of your receipt. I think that's a good point. Um, I think most countries with VAT actually do that. Uh, not all of them, but I think most of them do. And I think it's partly so that you could submit that receipt for reimbursement of that VAT if you resell it and charge another VAT. Mm. Right? Oh, that that's makes sense. Kind of, it um, fits with this framework where... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and if you like um, declare the amount of the what you bought in, in, when you go back to the U.S. or whatever, and you can like get the money back from Canada. I didn't know that. Like I was saying before, with definitely did not happen when I came back from the UK. I did not. Maybe because I didn't declare anything at customs, but I was. No one was like, "Ah, oh, if you bought things, you can get your tax back." That's what the form I had on the plane said. To them. <laughs> really? So the. I feel like I've seen that sometimes too. But... So it's like Canada is not charging VAT to American consumers. Is that the deal? I mean, you don't Europe. get any benefits oh, from it. They like for the health care or something like that. Right. We don't oh, because they're, the they're doing that thing where they rationalize things based on, okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's because they want to incentivize tourism. Yeah. Could be, yeah. Yeah. That's probably the real reason. Yeah. You keep telling yourself that. What? That they really have an incentive based reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have an incentive to believe in incentives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Um, supporters of a VAT, meanwhile, say it is better for economic growth than an income tax because it doesn't tax savings or investment. And governments like it because it tends to bring in more revenue, thanks in part to the role that businesses play in its collection. Incentivizing their efforts, businesses receive credits for the VAT they pay. Right. Yeah, we kind of talked about this at the beginning that, you yeah. know, you want to report it. Well, there's the double reporting most of the right. way along the supply chain. And then at the last, at the end of it, you still want to report it because there's a good chance that the rebate that you'll get will be More. bigger than the yeah. portion of the VAT that you have to pay. So that's, that is pretty clever. Yeah. It also helps seem seemingly like a foreign, con a foreign company selling goods in the U.S. also has to pay it, right? So mm -hmm. it also seems to help with like this general globalization of the economy. Like it seems like a more yes. appropriate tax for a globalized economy where it's not so simple whether a company is like a U.S. company or an Irish company or a British company. But we still have, right. it still is sort of sensical that individual people are citizens of particular countries at the moment. Right. So it kind of makes sense. And, that, and that's a good point. You know, right. when we're comparing to the income tax, 
if the income is going to workers in India, then they're not paying an income tax. Right. Uh, but if the products they're producing are being sold in the United States, then the VAT right. is going to be So paid. I guess also if you're yeah. like a wealthy country that people tend to want to sell things to, it's a relatively good tax to collect, which I guess a lot of the like Western European nations that use this are kind of in that category. Yes. Like yep. If you basically are full of wealthy consumers that people want to sell stuff to and can sell stuff to at a pretty high price, you can collect more revenue from a tax. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a tax on selling to consumers in that country. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, go ahead, Richard. On a radio program or whatever, they said that Portugal um, disincentivized the black market. They had this like sweepstakes or something like that for where you can put your... Um, tax uh, um, number or whatever on it, your income tax number on it, and then you can be raff, raffled for a, like a car or something. But and if you so, win, you get audited? <laughs> no, I don't know. Sorry, continue. So, and so instead of going to the black market to buy things, you go to the store and you can print it, put your number on it, and then they submit it for a raffle to get a car. So you get a raffle ticket for everything you buy? Mm -hmm. For every dollar you spend, maybe? I don't know exactly. Okay. But for each receipt you submit. For each receipt you submit. But there's a. Feel like there's ways to game that. <laughs> if you can buy, yeah, if you buy like a one, get a receipt for each thing you buy instead of. Yes. I want a receipt for each one of those Swedish fish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I made my groceries, and they're like, I would like to pick up each of these apples. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. This is one apple. on a separate receipt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so this is a separate yeah. receipt. This other apple is a separate yeah. receipt. If they did it per dollar spent, I think I think that would make more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then, and but the then wealthy people are just going to win the cars all the time. Yeah, it's going to be pointless to join oh, a black person because you're not rich. Uh, uh, also, it's no wealthy reason. people are probably well. Wealthy it people are, depends on like what black market they're trying to distance. Yeah, them, that's so. a good true, true. Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're probably getting the consumers to kind of play watchdog on the sellers, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the consumers report that they they bought something. They ask for a receipt wherever they go, and mm -hmm. they want to submit it to the raffle. Um, and then that means the sellers have to actually charge the tax. And in Russia, they said they have this program. We have they have forced all the Businesses to buy these um, cash registers that re report all sales within 90 seconds. And so the, the guy who was reporting it went to the, instead of the red building, it's an orange building because it's, they want to disassociate it from Soviet Russia. And so um, they, they um, when he went there, they had all the the sort of drink that he bought at this cafe that they, uh, um, an hour before or something like that. And so they didn't know which of the coffees that he bought was, was his, but they knew that it was his coffee. He bought a coffee there. Okay. The answer to all of these problems is surveillance. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like a bad answer. Yeah. All right. Let's get on to another quote. <laughs> Um, what our nation needs is a fair and simple tax structure that is conducive to economic growth and that better positions U.S. workers and businesses to compete in today's slow growth global economy. We are hobbled by our heavy, heavy reliance on income taxation. The rest of the world has taken a very different path. So, I mean, like, this is largely pointing out that almost everyone has a VAT. Almost every country in the world has a VAT, and we don't. Um, and... You know, I kind of highlighted this a little bit because, you know, the traditional emphasis on workers, um, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. But like, I mean, I, I think... because of the income tax, he's highlighting workers because workers make an income that's currently being taxed, right? Isn't that oh, the idea? I, yeah, I mean, everybody makes an income. Um, I think... I think... Better positions U.S. workers and businesses to compete. I think that's more about the complexity and simplifying things. Hmm. Um, I don't think he's worried about high... I mean, I think he's probably worried about high income tax, disincentivizing really high-paying work. 
Um, but when you say when you when you say like U.S. workers, you're usually not thinking like primarily like high earning workers. You're thinking of the workers, mm. right? Could be. Yeah. Like steel workers or something. But yeah. You're saying workers guys. and businesses, so I'm not sure. Workers and businesses. So business. So that yeah. So that that's the other clue, which is workers and businesses. So he's emphasizing the workers on one side and the businesses on the other. Yeah. I think it's mostly just an emphasis of uh, the simplification, and then he has like the fair, fair and simple, right? Um, you know, there's this whole, um, you know, everyone has a different idea of what's fair. That's why you know I like to not not get into what's fair in these discussions too much. But there are a lot of people who feel that um, taxing a higher percentage of of people's income if they're rich is unfair because um, you're punishing them for doing something that earned a lot of income, which presumably was good or something like that. Um, then there are other people who say it's unfair that, that rich people pay so little. Um, I think there's a reasonable case to be made for anyone's notion of what's fair and what's not. Um, I like the, the argument about um, benefiting workers and businesses. Um, ultimately, you know, I want to benefit consumers. You know, the workers and the businesses are there to serve the people. And that's how we should think about it. Um, and to the extent that helping workers and businesses be more efficient is good for people, then great. Yeah. Uh, you look, a question. Yeah. Why do you think that that is so popular? Because I was sort of reading ahead to like the discussion of how so many countries have it. Or I guess this paragraph sort of points that out too. So is it because it's a really good tax? Or like, what, what do you think it's taken off? Um, and I think they mentioned this in the article. I think a big part of it is that it's just a simple way to generate a lot of revenue for the government. Right. Like it's low hanging fruit almost. It's like, yeah. oh man, we can just put a bat in there and then, you know, like we can generate get all this, all this revenue, do right. all the spending, that kind of thing, which right. sounds great. Um, if you think you actually have to do that in order to spend. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of what Andrew Yang is thinking, right? Right. He's like, oh, you know, everyone else already did this, and we have this low-hanging fruit that everyone else picked that we haven't picked yet, right. and now we can pick it. Yeah. And he comes up with this moral framing of, you know, like, oh, we are taxing every uh, Google transaction and Uber Mile and Amazon sale and that kind of thing. That, whatever, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, but it's, you know, I think, I think this is why he's doing it, because he sees it as low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so since we're talking about Andrew Yang, like w with the debate coming up and stuff, would the VAT fund his uh, his one thousand dollar a month basic income? It's like almost a hundred billion dollars. It almost certainly would not. Okay. Yeah. Um, if Andrew Yang implemented his plan, it would likely increase the deficit by a lot. Okay. And I keep using the word likely because it's really hard to predict the exact macroeconomic effects right. of a lot of these things. Right. He's counting. Yeah lower costs for prisons and right, right. medical care as part right. of what's going to pay for it. Right, yes. right, right. Okay. Um, I, think, I think his plan would be enormously beneficial to the economy, even with the VAT packed on it, onto it. Um, I don't know how much, of a, how much it will increase the deficit, and I don't care. Um, as long as he can convince people that we should do it and he gets it passed, then, then I'm good to go. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right, next one. If we get th through these extra fast, I have a bonus for you guys. Bonus? <laughs> yeah. Um, shifting taxes from production to consumption would stimulate jobs and investments and induce companies to base headquarters here rather than abroad. Taking the additional step of taxing imports and exempting exports would yield hundreds of billions of dollars for the U.S. Treasury in the decade ahead. So there's kind of two things here. I probably should have split this into two quotes. So the first part is he's saying shifting taxes from production to consumption. But as we pointed out, um, the VAT can be both. And if we keep output prices stable, then it's entirely a tax on production, right? But people do think of sales tax, VAT tax as consumption taxes. But any tax has an effect throughout the economy. And if you keep consumer prices stable, then it's only a tax on production. Um, Induce companies to base headquarters here. I, I, I think since it, since since you're paying the tax, e wait here rather than abroad, because 
It stimulates jobs and investment. I mean, I don't think it stimulates Wait, jobs and investment. I'm not following this. How does yeah. he I think, is, is he maybe assuming that he's, we would have a VAT and we would lower the corporate tax rate? Uh, yeah, I, like I, I think that's right. He's it. Right. So when he says shifting taxes from production right. to consumption, uh, um, okay. he's talking about, right, that's right, Nick. He's talking about lessening income tax, corporate tax, that kind of thing. I got you. Um, now, I don't think it shifts taxes from production to consumption. It shifts taxes from production to a different tax on production uh, is kind of how I would frame it if we're if we're keeping the output prices stable, um, but it still um, it still might do it in a way that um, well, people can't you can't avoid the tax so. But I don't think that's yeah. quite right. I mean, uh, if you're you can avoid paying like like if you have one person making yeah. a lot of stuff, yeah, make a lot of it. Uh, and the taxes are coming from income taxes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. I was going to say that you know, ver versus a VAT, like if it's on the VAT, I guess right, it depends whether it raises the price or not. But you can avoid paying the tax. By right. So I think it's a tax on your production. Uh, any, any goods that are sold to American consumers, regardless of where your headquarters are, right? So I still think he is right that um, it would at least remove the disincentive to have your headquarters somewhere else. And then if you're lessening the income tax, lessening the corporate tax, and it's all of that, um, then, well, you might as well have your headquarters in America because you're paying the VAT either way. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that is right. Yeah. And what do you, if you have your headquarters here, you also have paying the rent on the building, or you buy the building and you have to pay that, and you have all these executives and things in the building that's in New Jersey or whatever. Right, right and they're going to spend money there, and you know, like there there would be other jobs as well. So when it says stimulate jobs, I think that's I think that's right as well. Um, you know, you'd hire your workers where you are instead of you know where you would have been. Um, so I think I think all of this is basically right. I just would um, I would just say that it's not shifting taxes from production to consumption. It's shifting the taxes uh, such that you have to pay them wherever you are. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers said Republicans don't like value added taxes because they are a money machine and Democrats don't like them because they are regressive. We will get a that, he said. When the Democrats realize that it is a money machine and the Republicans realize that it is regressive. <laughs> uh, clever. Story. I just thought that was cute. That is cute. <laughs> yeah. That is um, cute. Yeah. I mean, I think it is a money machine. I think it's only regressive, obviously, if consumer prices go up. Um, yeah. But you have to spend, if under the 10% that, you have to spend $120,000 per year to um, have a this go through the twelve thousand uh, dollar freedom dividend. That's only assuming if the prices go up, if the consumer prices go up, mm -hmm. right? If they don't, then it's you don't pay anything. The consumers pay nothing. They might lose jobs or lose incomes or something because uh, they get taxed on the production side. Um, okay. To the contrary, we will get a VAT only as part of a major tax re reform designed to ensure that it is neither regressive nor a money machine. The potential for regressivity should be addressed for low and moderate income households by eliminating payroll taxes and through debit cards which cancel taxes at the cash register. You know what's better than debit cards which cancel taxes at the cash register? Basically, yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, and I, and I th I think that's true. And and um, you know, I read a few articles. I didn't just read this one. I read a few articles about that. And it is often proposed that you know, when Andrew Yang talks about it, he's like, "Oh, we want a basic income, and we'll fund it using a VAT." But then I read articles about VAT, and they say like, "Oh, we want a VAT, but it's got these regressive properties, which we can uh, completely cancel out and move in the other direction by balancing it with." you know, demo grants or something similar to a basic income or, or debit cards, which cancel taxes at the, at the cash register or stuff like that. So it's, 
So it's interesting how kind of tied together these two things are in the discourse, even if they don't call it basic income. Well, right, and the, the, yeah. the second guy uses it as a reason not to have a VAT because you would have to start making like cash grants to poor people. Right. Yeah. And, like that would be horrible. Well, the worst. <laughs> yeah. So bad. Why would we yeah. do that? He doesn't realize that we're already doing that through monetary policy. Oh, don't tell him. And so sad. we're doing it really inefficiently <laughs> in such a way that not everyone gets it. Uh, so this is, um, I think, the next guy. This is the guy who's the skeptic of the VAT. Uh, yes, David R. Henderson. Uh, the evidence is strong that a VAT makes it easier for the government to tax more. The VAT is, in short, a revenue machine for big government. All other things being equal, the higher, the, the higher taxes are, the lower economic growth is. Moreover, higher taxes, even if they didn't hurt growth, would put more money in the hands of government, which spends more rec recklessly and wastefully than we spend our own money. I mean, like, that's true for some things. There are some things that are more efficiently allocated by the market. There are some things that are more efficiently allocated by government. These kind of blanket statements about, like, uh, government spending is always worse and that kind of thing, like, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, it's like arguing that this tax is bad because it, like, works well and it's efficient. Right. It's like... Easy like, to implement and like, does he pref out. does he prefer other taxes because they are, they are less efficient or like harder to you know like? Yeah, we should yeah. just not fund the government. That would be the idea. It's an argument against right. yeah. taxes. Period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I guess if, if I agree that uh, government spends more recklessly and wastefully, then uh, UBI would would solve that because it wouldn't be the government would just be giving UBI rather than so. I don't think you can blanket say that the government spends more recklessly and wastefully on everything. I think there are certain things that just can't be efficiently allocated by the market. But I think he's pointing out that like if you take the VAT and give it back to people, then it's still the people spending the money. Oh, yes. Right? Isn't That's that right. your, your yeah. point? Yeah. It's still people yeah. spending the money again, basically. Right. Yeah. I didn't realize you were making that yeah. point. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's exactly right. The VAT would be um, not the government spending. If you're, if you're pairing it with the basic income, it would right. be... Uh, it would be funding the market. Yeah, the government doesn't yeah. have to be smart to to, to pay out a basic income. Yeah. You yeah. can be really dumb and pay out a basic income. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's Another true. benefit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, like that article I sent you about uh, in Africa, and where they if they implement a basic income, then they have an incentive to keep the government from being corrupt, so they get more of a basic income. There you go. That's interesting. I love to, getting incentives to you know. Yeah. To to Nick, to your point, I think. It is an argument against all taxes, but I think he's trying to make an empirical argument that like it somehow seems to make it psychologically easier for voters or something to have a higher tax rate. And at least empirically, like countries have raised their tax rates more after implementing a VAT. Right. The VAT in particular yeah. is, claim, is an easy know. tax to get away with. Therefore, we should fear it more. I mean, we don't know if there, yeah. these tax rates would have risen anyway historically or like I'm not sure right. if his data is rock solid, but that seems to be what he's trying to claim. Yeah, and I think I think you know generally governments are trying to be fiscally responsible and balance their budgets, and you know you can imagine them making arguments like, oh, this is just a more efficient way to collect the taxes we already collect, and we get benefits from that and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, governments aren't spending enough, and if you make it easier for them to spend, that you know is going to allow them to spend more. There are going to be pressures that get them to spend more. Because it's actually needed in the economy. But it's matters of yeah. what they spend. Like you don't want them to spend tons of money on like the military industrial complex because they're going to buy a dozen tanks that the military doesn't want. I do not want them to do that. That is correct. Uh, it does depend on what the government spends on. I think these guys are that's not what they're thinking. They're not worried about the government spending more money on tanks. Well, I think uh, this guy is. Well, maybe not tanks, who knows, but he's worried about them spending it on things that he doesn't think are valuable. Right. Maybe he thinks tanks are in that category. Well, I mean, I think he, he's probably, he would probably object, object to giving it to poor people, too, right? Because he thinks that, you know, you need, poor people should earn their money in the market. But maybe you know? he wouldn't object to UBI, we don't know. I mean, at least saying that right. the government spends wastefully, like like you said, Steve, doesn't really It's kind argue, of a blanket, yeah. Doesn't really argue against giving it as, people, as a UBI. I mean, he right. doesn't really flesh out his point there. Like you said, it's kind of a right. blanket point. All right. Yeah. 
Why does a VAT make it easier for government to raise revenue? One possible reason is that the VAT is nearly invisible. When you pay for an item, you don't see the tax itemized on your receipt. Okay, so that he put the word itemized in there right. because it's it's just a blanket number at, at the bottom of mm. your receipt. It's not like per. So that's that's kind of the sneaky trick he played there. It is on the receipt, it's just not itemized huh. usually. Um, it just depends on what you mean by itemized. I guess if the receipt is one item, then it is itemized. But yeah. I think usually itemized means it, you know, it has a corresponding tax for each individual thing that you bought. Yeah. Um, you don't see the tax on, itemized on your receipt. You may not be aware of how big the tax is. Well, you should be if you see it on the receipt at all. And VATs tend to be hidden. Ironically, another possible reason VATs have led to government growth is that because VATs are more efficient at raising revenue, governments are tempted to raise VATs. Whichever explanation is correct, the sad truth is that VATs are not an engine of economic growth, but rather an engine of government growth. Well, I think that that is, I think they're generally not an engine of, ec of economic growth if you're just doing the VAT and throwing out the money. Um, I think they are an engine of government growth to the extent that the government is only allowing itself to spend money if it actually collects tax revenues, which um, actually isn't even true um, in the strictest sense. I mean, we always run a deficit. We could be running more of a deficit, but, you know, um, under the specific conditions that uh, we say that, you know, the government is only allowed to spend the government money that it collects through taxes, then that can be an engine for government growth. Yes. Given all of those qualifications, I agree. And I don't think that that's a reason not to have a VAT. The reason not to have a VAT would be the first thing, that it's, um, it, doesn't that it to produce. slows down the economy. Yeah. yeah. Um, one further problem with a VAT is that it would take a much higher percentage of income from low-income people than the current tax system does. A way around that is to send checks to lower-income people who apply. The checks would be so large, though, what? that the fraud would be substantial. His problem is that the checks would be large? Uh, his problem is that when you make them large, then the fraud would be substantial. But the amount of money going to the poor people would therefore also be substantial. Well, not if it's all eaten up by fraud. What fraud? I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> like, what is he talking about? Uh, like people would under-report their incomes, and then so they would qualify uh, for the... the Yes. Yeah. So people who aren't poor enough. Like, I see. People I see. people who shouldn't qualify uh, are are getting it. So he's not imagining a basic income. He's imagining. You but know, why would it they be that large? Like, they can only compensate for the vet. So they could. I guess they could be like ten percent of what you spend or something. Ten percent of everything you spent in the year, I guess, or yeah, something I like that. Pretty large. I mean, obviously, and all of this is only true if the vet actually raises consumer prices. Right. I keep having to say that over and over again. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's the article. Let's um, let's go to our bonus content here. Woohoo! Uh, yeah, it's not specifically about that. I'm gonna pause this so we don't get the sound from that. And we're gonna go here. And we're gonna go here. Is it Mankyu? Oh, it's Mankyu. Oh, that's the thing I sent you. Yeah. So he's let's. A, he's unmute. at Harvard. Right? Here we go. He is. Here we go. I'm going to start with what I hope is not a controversial statement. Uh, rich people are not all the same. We're going to go a little bit faster. Um, I bring up this fact because we live in a time of high inequality and demonizing the rich is popular in some political circles, so not with I hang around with. Um, and with a variety of policies being proposed to increase the redistribution of economic resources. Now, I'm not going to take half an hour suggestions to decide why we need more redistribution of economic resources. That's an issue as much for political philosophy as it is for economists. I'm just going to say, suppose we're going to increase the redistribution of economic resources more, how do we do it? Uh, and in particular, as we think about uh, alternative proposals, I think it's really important to keep in mind uh, that rich people uh, differ uh, from one another. So let's consider two hypothetical CEOs of major corporations. Each of them earn a lot of money, 10 or $20 million a year, say, putting them safely in the top one one hundredth of one percent of the income distribution. But other than their incomes, which are the same, these two executives are very different. The first executive I'll call Sam Spendthrift. There he is. He uses all his money living the high life. Drinks expensive wine, drives Ferraris, flies his private jet to lavish vacations. He gives large amounts to political parties and candidates, hoping these contributions will get him ambassadorship someday. 
Uh, when that doesn't work, he spends large sums financing his own quixotic run for the presidency. I don't have any big T-car model. Uh, the other executive I'll call Frank Frugal. He makes just as much money as Sam, but he takes a very different approach to his good fortune. He lives modestly, saves most of his earnings, and accumulating a sizable nest egg. He forgoes the opportunity to influence the political process. He's not really very political. Instead, he invests his money in successful startups, which he happens to be quite good at identifying. He plans to leave some of his wealth to his children, grandchildren, nephews, and nieces. Most of his wealth, however, he plans to bequeath to the endowment of his alma mater, maybe Harvard, where it will support financial aid uh, for generations to come. Okay, now ask yourself, who should pay higher taxes? Sam Spendthrift or Frank Frugal? Now I can see the case for taxing them the same. After all, they have the same earnings. One might say that how they choose to spend their money is not an issue for the government to judge or influence. Personally, however, I'm more inclined to think that Mr. Frugal should be taxed less than Mr. Spendthrift. And the argument is really Pagovian. It has to do with externalities. Mr. Frugal's behavior confers positive externalities both on members of his extended family and on the beneficiaries of his charitable bequest. Moreover, by increasing the economy's capital stock, it reduces the rate of return to capital, increases labor productivity and real wages. The economists will recognize that as a pecuniary externality, but if one's concerned about the income distribution, this pecuniary externality can also be viewed uh, as desirable. And what I find hard to believe is that Mr. Frugal should face higher taxes than Mr. Spendthrift. But that is what occurs under the policy proposals being discussed, in particular the wealth taxes being advocated by Senators Warren and, and Sanders. Now I'm skeptical that these taxes can be implemented successfully, but I'm not going to actually talk about that today because we're getting a limited time. But let's suppose they are su implemented successfully. These taxes are going to hit Frank Frugal hard and are going to be much easier on Sam Spendthrift because he doesn't accumulate the large nest egg. They might say, okay, well, that's at the cost of, of redistributing economic resources, and this is the only possible tax on the table that I can kind of see the argument in favor, but there are a lot of other ideas uh, that, are on, that are on the table. And I think, in particular, there are ways to redistribute economic resources in a ways that do not penalize frugality. In particular, I am attracted to something along the lines of the policy now being championed by Andrew Yang, the former tech executive and entrepreneur who is now running for the Democratic nomination. What? Mr. Yang proposes enacting a value-added tax and using the revenue to provide every American with a universal basic income of $1,000 a month, which he called a freedom dividend. It's pretty easy to see how this idea would work. Value-added taxes are essentially sales taxes. They're used in a lot of European nations, and they've pro proven remarkably efficient ways to raise revenue. And because the dividend is universal, it would be simple to administer. Now, of course, the idea of universal basic income is not new, but it is certainly bold compared to the system we have in place now. The idea has its critics, and what I want to do is talk about some of the arguments that people make uh, about uh, opposed to universal basic income. I think it's some valid arguments, but I think a lot of the arguments you hear really don't hold up under scrutiny. So let me just use an example to, um, to discuss why. Okay, I want, you, I want to consider two possible social safety nets, which you're going to see on the screen in front of you in a second. For the purposes of today, let's assume these are balanced budget, so don't have to worry about deficit issues. The first one is a, uh, a means-tested transfer. So we give everybody $1,000 per month aimed at the truly needy. So the full amount goes to somebody with zero income, which is person at the very bottom. The transfer is then phased out. Recipients lose 20 cents for every dollar of income they earn. These transfers are financed by a progressive income tax. So there's no, no, no taxes on below $60,000 and a 20% uh, tax on all income above $60,000. Now the second policy is co closer to what Mr. Yang is proposing, a universal transfer of $1,000 per month for every person financed by a 20% flat tax on all incomes. Now think for a moment whether you prefer to live in a society with safety net A or safety net B. Now I'm not going to take a vote here, uh, but I did actually take this to a bunch of Harvard students, Harvard undergraduates, and I gave them exactly this experiment, and they were unequivocal in their preference, absolutely unequivocal. Over 90% said plan A is clearly better. And uh, the argument basically ran as follows. Plan A targets the transfer payments of those who are truly needy, and the result requires a smaller tax increase. Moreover, the taxes are levied only on those people with really high incomes. Plan B is crazy. Why should rich people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos receive government transfers? They don't need it. And if they give it to them, they have to raise taxes more to pay for it. Well, superficially, these arguments seem appealing. But here's the rub. As the economists note, these policies are exactly the same. Look at the net payment that is taxes and less transfers. Everyone gets exactly the same under these two plans. Person with zero income gets $12,000 per year in both cases. Person with an annual income of $60,000 gets exactly zero. A person with income of $160,000 pays $20,000 in both cases, and everyone pay, pays the same set of incentives, a 20% effective marginal tax rate for every dollar of income. In other words, everybody's welfare is identical under the two plans, and everyone faces the same set of incentives. The difference between plan A 
and plan B is only a matter of planning. Now, I bring this up. This is kind of obvious to the economists in the audience, but I bring this up because I think it teaches really two important lessons. First, if somebody finds something like plan A attractive, which all my Harvard students did, and once they sort of recognize the logic that it said plan A and plan B is equivalent, they shouldn't find something like plan B attractive. Many critics of universal basic income seem to fail to make this leap, but they don't notice the equivalence of the two approaches, and I've had debates with some economists who didn't notice it the first time they saw it. But once you see the equivalence of plan A and plan B, plan B is much easier to embrace. I think what's even better, when you realize that universal benefits and flat taxes may be easier to administer than means-tested benefits and progressive taxes. The second lesson from this example is how misleading it is to focus on taxes and transfers separately. Now, it is fully accurate comparing plan A and plan B to say that plan A has lower taxes, plan A has more progressive taxes, and plan A has more progressive transfers. That's all true. But so what? Those facts don't stop it from being precisely equivalent to plan B. The equivalence of these two plans is clear only when you consider taxes and transfers together. Now, I stress this fact because it's all too common to see academic papers and media articles describe the distribution of taxes without considering the distribution of the transfers they finance. In fact, Emmanuel did that with us just a few minutes ago. From my perspective, such presentations of the data are incomplete to the point of being deceptive. With this, that kind of incomplete reporting, you would conclude that plan A, that a society using plan A is a more progressive society than a society using plan B. But that is obviously not the case because the policies are functionally the same. Finally, I should note that the safety net described in either of these plans, which I do as equivalent and the difference not being important, the, 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 uh, the plan is really just a version of the negative income tax. Uh, Milton Friedman first proposed it in a, in a book, I don't know if he's probably in the first, but I first read Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, back in 1962 when he wrote it. Um, I remember reading it as a student four years ago uh, and thinking it was a pretty good idea. Um, and it turned out I was not alone in that judgment. A few years after that, that there was an uh, open letter uh, in 1968 uh, was signed by more than a thousand economists endorsing a negative income tax plan along these lines. They didn't have particular numbers involved, but it was the general principle of a negative income tax. And it was signed by such luminaries as James Tobin, Paul Samuelson, Peter Diamond, Martin Feldstein. Now, of course, they weren't all luminaries at the time, but they became luminaries. Um, so what, they, so what, what um, Andrew Yang is proposing is basically a version of what these thousand economists uh, endorsed uh, back in um, 1968. There's a little difference. You know, I think the 68 economists were talking about tax on income. So Andrew Yang is, is, is focused on consumption of the value-added tax. From my perspective, that's actually better because it doesn't distort the intertemporal incentive to, to save and invest. Um, but it's, sort of, it's, it's, I think, morally equivalent in a lot of ways to what was being talked about uh, by those thousand economists in 1968. They have to ask the question of, could a thousand economists all be wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yes, they could. <laughs> so I have to admit that. Um, but I don't think in this case they are. Uh, my own view is that uh, universal income financed by an efficient tax um, something like a value-added tax uh, might well be something worth considering. And indeed, I'm a lot of signatories, as is, as is Larry Summers, have a plan to do something similar in a smaller way, but financing the carbon tax. We're, we're a part of a group called the Climate Leadership Council that's proposing a, a carbon tax and rebating the uh, revenue from the carbon tax lump sum to all, house, to all households. Uh, and that's in, fact, in a very small way, a little bit like the uh, universal uh, basic income. Uh, thank you very much, and let me, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um... Just how we, you know, we can look at, you know, a sales tax or something and, and see that that's, we know that that's a regressive tax and kind of make our judgments based on that. And I think a lot of people do um, when they look at something like Yang's plan, um, you know, even though it, it, it kind of comes with a, a universal basic income. Um, obviously, the examples he used there were not uh, sales tax based. They were they were income tax based. Um, he brought up the point of uh, intertemporal decision making with income tax. And that's also a reason I don't like income tax. Mm -hmm. So that basically means, you know, kind of like like you, um, your per year income is lower, and you're paying less total income tax because you're doing uh, a lot of teaching this academic year, right. but it's all this semester and the spring semester. So for the calendar years, your income is lower, so you don't pay as much income tax. But why is that a problem? Uh, because the the distortions just mean that you have an incentive to you know readjust your. But if you did that every your, year, it would it would it would average out. If you did that every year, it would average out. Yeah. But if you did it, so but if you if if instead you did every other year, like if you did a lot of work in calendar year 2019 and then no work in calendar year 2020, yeah. a lot of work in 2021, you'd be paying a lot more income tax per year. That's right. So that just kind of creates distor distortionary incentives in the market. Um, uh, so 
Quickly, uh, Michael had a comment. Do people fear government spending because we use terms like national debt and deficit spending? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, w wouldn't there be a better way to describe those things that wouldn't make people equate those things to their own personal debt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Probably. Good point. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of kind of framing issues here um, right. with a lot of a lot of stuff with economic policy, not just with basic yeah. income. Which is part of what Maggie yeah. was talking about too. Yeah. Um, uh, let's get quick final thoughts. Yeah, I feel like that. I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, about the value added tax and other taxes. Yep. Steve. Um, sometime later, I'm going to try to defend a wealth tax because I just have an intuition that. Cool. Okay. I know it when I see it, and then I just have to <laughs> All right. figure out what I mean. We should bring in Mancu. Yeah. <laughs> Nick. Um, yeah, interesting discussion. Cool. Elizabeth? Um, yeah, I feel like I understand like how that actually works much better now. I like saw that diagram there, and I was like, I don't really understand what's happening yeah. here. And so I feel like I understand a lot better how it functions. Cool. Richard. I only had a vague understanding of the VAT before this discussion, but now I have, it seems much clearer to me and, well, more appetizing, I guess you could say. Wow. Wow, that's great. I'm glad, um, I'm glad people have gotten a little more clarity from this. Um, I know the discussion was kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like, I think what I always think, which is that we don't need any tax to fund the basic income. There are probably better taxes than VAT if we're forced to make it revenue neutral. Um, but VAT isn't the end of the world uh, and we'll be fine. Andrew Yang's plan will probably end up with a massive deficit um, as he's designed it. But if he can convince people to pass it through, um, then it doesn't matter. Uh, all right. Uh, this was great, guys. Uh, yeah. Next week, we're going to be on Thursday, Debates. and we're going to be talking about the debate, which is happening on Wednesday, Very which is exciting. why we're not going to be on Wednesday. Um, so yeah, um, see you guys next week. Thanks, guys.